You guys ready? My name is Josh Kane. I think I've met a lot of you here before. No bad. I'm a senior application developer here at the university. I work in the Office of Communications and Marketing, which is under the Vice President for Strategic Communication. I don't work in our IT office. I work with them. We have a very good collaboration. Today's session is on pre-process hooks. Um, in terms of goals, I oriented this presentation towards the designer themer. How many of you are designer themers? Eh, that's all right. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Very good. Um, Pre-process hooks are a pretty powerful tool. Um, they use PHP. They're a preferred method, um, but they're also a really good introduction to writing PHP and using the Drupal API. Um, it's more contained, and especially if you're a designer theme or you're somebody who's used to working with CSS and on the front end, um, you can see the connections between the PHP code you're writing and what comes out of Drupal. Um, so I found it to be a pretty good introduction. It was actually how I got into writing uh, Drupal um, code. From pre-process hooks, once you're doing it, it's actually a fairly easy leap to um, writing custom modules and writing your own functions that tie into the API code. So that's kind of the goal here. I work with designers um, in my shop, so I wanted to try to create a bridge between sort of the hardcore programming tech in Drupal and um, the design world and the theming world. So um, first we'll talk about why to use preprocess hooks, talk about which hooks and where to put them talk about what data you can alter, and then we're actually going to do a live demo. I've got um, a version of, um, I've got a damp stack running on this laptop, and we'll actually make edits to the template.php file um, with preprocess hooks so you can actually see what's happening. I've actually already written all the code, so I'll just be commenting it out so you won't have that excruciatingly painful thing of watching somebody type on a screen, um, unless I really screw up, in which case you'll get to watch me type on a screen. So why use preprocess hooks? Um, they are far more efficient in terms of Drupal performance. For those of you who use Drupal, you know it's a pig. It uses up a lot, a lot of processing. This actually makes it faster. Prior to Drupal 7, you used, you'd make all these same sort of edits at the TPL file level, which gets iterated over quite a bit. Um, it was just a lot slower. This speeds stuff up because you're working with the data before it's rendered. Not only does it improve performance, but you get cleaner code because um, really this is third point. You keep a separation between your business logic and your display logic, and Drupal is really expanded in that way, and I think it's going to be even more important in Drupal 8. So the, keeping that separation keeps your code clean, it makes it easier, it makes it more efficient. It's generally, um, it's sort of one of the hidden gems of Drupal 7, so when you get to do this. Um, I learned about this from Eric Webb, who came in and did a seminar with us. He came from Acquia. And I said, well, I'm doing this to TPL file, and I thought he was going to hit me. He's like, you're using Drupal 7, do it this way. And I'm like, okay. And if, you know, if you've ever met Eric Webb, you won't actually believe. But seeing him angry was really startling, because he's this sort of tall, spidery kind of guy. And he looked at me like, what are you doing wrong? And I was like, okay. So I'm sure Eric's listening to this at some point. So, so a hook. A hook is a user-created PHP function that um, it follows specific naming uh, conventions in Drupal, um, and as long as you get the name right and you feed it the right variables, Drupal is looking for these, and it looks to see does this hook exist, um, and it allows you to make that call. So a hook is really just a function that uses special naming. Um, you use hooks all kinds of different places in Drupal. What we're going to work on is just pre-process hooks, and those are specific to the template.php file. Have you all seen the template.php file in your themes? The nice thing about preprocess hooks is because they go in the template.php file, they're theme specific. So if you have multiple themes, you can actually write hooks that only happen when you're viewing it in that theme and have different behavior in a different one. Um, every time I look at Drupal and I go, why did they make the file system so complicated? And then I have a use case where that's the exact thing that I needed was that the file system was that complicated. I've just gotten to the point where it, with Drupal, if I look at something and I go, why is this so complicated? I don't assume that anybody was being lazy. I assume I, didn't know what, I don't know why yet, and then I'll figure it out later. So here's a quick example. So the theme name, I just picked Tenderloin, because it's Drupal corn. The preprocess hook, 
Here for the example is template underscore preprocess underscore HTML. When you call that from the template.php file in your tenderloin theme, this is the line that you write. With the spinning disk on it. So you can see you replace template with your template name. Then you need to feed it a, whatever the variables that are required by the function, and this changes depending on which hook you're calling. This page right here, it actually runs a search, and I brought it up here. Where did it go? Oh, I know where I put it. These are the preprocess hooks in Drupal 7. So you can see there's quite a few of them. This link tells you. The thing is, is each preprocess hook, because it modifies different data, has a different sort of format to the function in various pieces, you really have to play. And so what we're going to do with the live demo is we're actually going to play with some of this stuff um, on screen. So you can see, I'm not going to be able to show you everything about preprocess hooks, but the idea is to give you a leg up so you can go back and start monkeying with it and get your white screen of death and then erase it and whatnot. Do you guys know white screen of death? Yeah, everybody knows white screen of death. Um, this is the fastest way to create a white screen of death and then undo it, is monkeying with your template.php file. So these are the core preprocess functions. Um, a lot of modules will actually add their own in. I'm not entirely certain how that works, but I know that Views puts in place several. I have a theory that any time you have a TPL file, Drupal automatically puts in a preprocess hook, but I don't know that that's true. It's held true so far for me. So if you look in here, views isn't listed. It's not part of core. Sometimes you um, discover, oh, there's a preprocess hook for that. It didn't even occur to me. A lot of this is hunting around. But we're going to show you how to hunt around in a very efficient way that actually makes things um, kind of interesting. There we go. So what data can you alter? There is lots and lots of data, but it varies upon the hook that you call. Um, in addition, sometimes when you call a hook in a preprocess, you'll see variables, and you can use them for decisions, but you can't actually change them there. So for example, the body field, it appears in a bunch of different preprocess hooks, but you can only change it in the field one. Again, you just have to experiment. There's a lot of experimentation that goes on here, and the documentation is enough to get you to experiment, but it's not going to be uh, comprehensive. And part of the reason for that is that the data that you have access to in preprocess hooks is very dependent upon the modules that you have installed and the fields that you've created. Um, and if you do anything with media and some of the file entity extension stuff, it gets even hairier. There's a lot of stuff. So the best way I've found, and this is the recommended way from everything I've read, to be able to see the data that's available to a hook, and this includes the preprocess hooks, is with the devil module. How many of you have installed the devil module? <laughs> yeah, you got it. It's this crazy thing. You just have to call the DPM function and put in the object or variable, and it creates uh, a clickable, uses Chromo, it creates a clickable navigational piece so you can actually view all of the arrays and objects and data and strings and everything that's stored in there. So for example, DPM variables. That's it. So let's see what that looks like. So what I've done, loaded a local DAMP stack. Have you ever, have any of you um, installed Acquia's dev desktop? It um, gives you a full DAMP stack, um, DAMP being, you know, Drupal, Apache, MySQL, PHP. It gives you that in it with a single Windows installer. And it's designed for you to be able to upload stuff to Drupal Gardens, but it's also a great way to very quickly um, get yourself an environment to play with. So let's see what DPM does. Where did it go? Ah, there we go. All right, so what I did was I took uh, the dev version of the University of Iowa information site and I pulled it out of my dev and not good dev desktop and I migrated it to this machine. So we're running a full DAMP stack with a site that's, you know, hop, skip, and a jump for production. These two blocks at the top, one's for training, one's for testing. If you see both, you know you're in dev. I work alone. I sometimes do weird things with colors. So 
Well, let's see what we get here. All right, we're going to come to this page. You see that right there? That's your DPM display. Now watch this. You've got all of this content in here. Items, markup, all this different stuff. The more fields you have, the more data you get. The more modules you have, the more data you can get. All of everything you see in here is available for decision making. So if you want to say, if access is true, do something, you could do that. A lot of these fields are also available for modification. So again, that code right there in this theme preprocess field, pull the variables over to there, gives you that display. That's how you learn what data is available to modify. We could spend an hour clicking through all this stuff, and it wouldn't register. It wouldn't mean anything, because you're going to go back, and your site's going to be different. But once you know that, you got to figure out which hook, what variable, put it together. This is how you explore it. Are there any questions on that? All right. Yep, Emerge version 1 is the theme. Then when you call, mm -hmm. it's template underscore. Um, yeah. I picked my theme names before I understood this or I had to use better theme names. <laughs> um, so anytime you call, a Drupal function with the devil module installed, you often will send variables to it. Any variable that you send, you can then DPM from within. So if you're doing things with the form API, it's DPM the form variable, which is even bigger. Um, again, the best process for this is digging around, seeing what you can find, trying to change stuff, getting frustrated, getting white screen of death, undoing it, and eventually it all starts to make sense. Um, there is a real logic to it. So. Let's do something easy. So not all elements can be changed, but all can be used for decision. Not every element is available to every hook. Um, sometimes you'll see variables, values that you'll want to change, and you'll write the code, and, and you'll change it, and it won't show up in your display. That means you're in the wrong hook. You can see it, but you can't change it. You can change it, but it doesn't matter. And it really has to do with how these function calls get stacked between the time you request the page and the time Drupal renders it. Um, if you were to map it, if you were to go to the trouble of really understanding how all of that works, you'd go completely insane, I'm convinced, which explains a lot of the weird stuff that happen happens at DrupalCon. I don't know if you guys have gone, but it can get, hmm. There was one guy who had a giant horn that somehow he managed to get on an airplane. It was very strange, though. So. I've actually run into situations where preprocess hooks don't do what I need, and you still have to modify the TPL file. But the standard practice is try to do with preprocess hooks as much as you can, and if you really can't, then edit the TPL file. So sometimes I will admit I've gotten frustrated, modified the TPL file, then figured out the hook later, and gone back and have to redo do it. All right, so let's modify the body field. We're going to run the DPM, see what we have to play with. We need to locate the value and change it. Let's see. So what do I have here? What did I say we were going to go? Items, zero, markup. All right. So you can see up here we have element. You get object, body here, and zero etc. Value. You can modify this using a preprocess hook. Modify this right here. We'll make a bit of difference in your display. Instead, you ignore the element and you go down to the items. And this is the markup that if you change it will affect the display. There are reasons why this is doubled up in here. I don't know what they are. I'm just going to trust that there are reasons. It's a lot of hunting and trying and experimenting. After about 20 hours of it, it starts to make sense, and you start to get a sense of where to go for what piece. So you just discovered that by 
Very much so. I'm an empirical learner. If you are an empirical learner and you want to learn programming, learn Python. I wish I had. So, long standing joke. Python enforces really good code sanit sanitary behaviors. Sanitite? No. Close enough? It's been a long camp. Yes? What is the order of the listing here? Is it in order of execution? So you're choosing the last one or something else? I have no clue. I, my experience with Drupal is that it's so vast, there's so much going on. Rather than trying to get my head around every single thing that's happening, I have problems that I solve with Drupal. And there's usually six different ways to do it, and if I can find two and pick between them, I feel fortunate. Um, so certain questions I've not had to answer yet, thankfully, and that's one of them. So, so what I know from prepping is that this is the markup we want to change. So we're going to come over the template. I'm going to open up this line. So this says, variables item zero markup. And if we bop over to here, you'll see, here's our array of variables. We're going to go to items, we're going to go to zero, and we're going to go to markup. So that's how you navigate down. This is just an array set. And all we're going to do is change all that nice content that's in there to that text. Let's see. Ta-da! Now, how many of you get that joke? Thank you. Um, now, what I want you to notice is that's all the code we've done. What we've actually done, though, is we've changed the body in every single node. Every time you load a page, it's going to run that code. So, we don't exactly want that. So, what, I'm gonna, what I did here was more specifically. What we do here is we're going to find out by node ID. And I happen to know that the file is node here. We're just going to say, if it's that node, then change it. And that way it will only affect one page. This is a basic decision structure. If you know that you only want, um, say, by content type, or if it has a piece that you want to change the markup, this is how you do it. So the preprocess hook is going to run every time that you pull up that body. By wrapping it in an if, you get yourself a little bit of room, or you, you can actually narrow it down. Um, rarely would you do it specifically by node ID, but that's an easy one to do. So let's see what that looks like. All right. Yes. I just know what I've been told. Okay. <laughs> so you can see now the severe one. It was more like, do it this way or I'm not talking to you ever again. Okay. So you can see on this page, which has the node ID 12, it stays. But on this page, it goes away. Again, a very simple example. This is not. This is teaching how to fish. Does that stay forever? Pardon? So now, say for instance, someone to go in and click edit. Mm -hmm. That variable changed forever. That content has changed forever. Like, well, no, it's not changed forever. It's not changed in the database. Awesome. Okay, that's not my question. So if you go to the form, all your original data is still going to be there. We're changing it between the time the page is requested and the time it's rendered. You get right in there. That's what these template preprocess hooks do. That's what I call it preprocess. It should be pre rendered but yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm so glad you asked that. That's a great question. I think if we do, I think just dot, right? There you go. Oh. 
Really? This is why I'm an empirical learner. <laughs> you, and it's half the fun of coming to these camps is I'll be doing something and I'll be doing it mostly right. And someone will be like, yeah, if you do this, I'm like, oh. So giving a presentation at a camp, I learn things all the time. You know, I sat in on Mark Bennett's session and I've been working with him on the sinus stuff back and forth. And he said three things and I was like, well, gosh, that would have made your life easier if I'd done it that way. So it's a good opportunity. Does that answer your question though? Yeah. So the steps are locate the node ID value. Let's go back. Let's pop up the DPM again. Show you where to find node ID. So this is where elements comes in and it's pretty nice. Because this gives you everything that's packaged. So when Drupal goes to render a node, it grabs everything that it can and it packages it into this huge set of variables. It's nested arrays and objects and whatnot. Um, so that it's available to you. Um, so you'll see down here, node ID equals 12. Now I do want to note one notation piece here. If you notice, these use arrays, an array standard. If you notice right here, this uses a different notation that connotates that this is actually a PHP object right here. So if you have a PHP object appear in your DPM display, the thing after it doesn't need quotes, it doesn't need a bracket, you use that notation instead. And the nice thing is, is that DPM shows you that right here. So if you see this, it it'll tell you what it is. Element is an array. Object happens to be an object. So you know that right there. I wasted about mm, three hours over time not remembering this. So, huh? A bottle, of a bottle of something, but <laughs> we work at a university. Any questions so far? All right. I have a yep. The new DPMs will actually show you recursive. Um, I don't know if I have it in here, but in certain cases, um, you'll go in and it'll just say recursive and it won't give you access to it. Um, I think that might be a change recently. Uh, yeah, it, it'll say recursive. And, and if you don't know why it says that, you're like, oh, but I want in there. But then if you realize what you'd get when you got in there, rabbit hole, so. Any other questions? All right. This one, move on to the next one. We're going to um, add some JavaScript. It's just a small little piece that I wrote. In this case, JavaScript gets added to preprocessed node. This again is sort of the hunt and peck. Stack Overflow and Google are your friends. Um, once you start working with this, you'll have a ton of questions. I've never run into a question that I didn't, that somebody else hadn't already asked. I've run into several where people have asked and had no good answer, but. So let's, I want to step out of this. Oops, wrong one. All right, so we're going to go to Node. All right, so this is some interesting code. Drupal add JS is a Drupal function. And you use it to add JavaScript. You can use it more places than just template.php. Drupal get path is a cheat. So you tell it, I want the path using the theme. Here's the theme name. And it converts, Drupal get path converts that and appends it to the pre sitting here. That makes it easy to migrate your, um, your template code between server environments. So if you change your template path between one environment and another, this code will still stay the same because we use that Drupal get path. Now, the way Drupal organizes JavaScript in this area 
is as an array, and there's various groups. You can have it cache or not cache and whatnot. But what this statement does is it says, add this to the, add this specific JavaScript file to the JavaScript you're going to load on this node. So let's see what that looks like. Now this is interesting. Have you notice I'm hitting reload a lot? Sometimes you have to reload several times before, and sometimes you even have to clear caches, before your changes will show up. And that can be very frustrating. I know this works because I did it. I promise you I tested this. This room has bad luck with code. So what this is supposed to do is this little alert, it pops up, and it'll show you the next set of lyrics for Rick Astley. One more try. Mm, not usually, because I'm doing full refreshes, but thank you. This laptop is wonderful to play movies on. I'm not sure it's good for anything else. All right, I'm just going to have you assume that that worked the way it's supposed to. I do know that this code set works because I use it in production for several things. So this set works very well. Am I going too fast, too slow? It just pops up an alert that gives you a couple of lyrics from a song. But you can put any kind of JavaScript in there. In fact, on Iowa Now, we use this exact, I copied this same content. We use it to launch the um, calendar event widget. It's on the home page. It works there, so. The thing is, I tested it on this machine. I think I'm just having bad luck. Um, I, I group debugging, I really get into it, but I think it makes everybody else anxious, so. Essentially, the rest of this was to show you Again, wrapping it in the node ID and whatnot. But we're just going to move on. We're creating an array. Drupal AdJS requires an array. Um, if you look up, Drupal add JS and look for some additional examples, you'll get a much more well-rounded view of it. So Drupal add JS is a, is a function that's built into Drupal. Um, there's a lot of additional API options. If, you, if you're going to do this, make friends with the API section at drupal.org. Um, it gives you all of them with very brief explanations and some code samples. It's not like the PHP documentation, but it's close enough. Once you've read about it, then you type it in and go to Stack Overflow, and you'll see real examples of it. It's kind of a good combination. I, I still am amazed that we could do any technology at all before we had decent search engines. So I certainly wasn't up for it. All right. Then we wrap it in an if again, same sort of thing. All right. This one, I actually had a real-world use for this. Challenge was, the user is an administrator. I wanted to add a class debug to the body tag. And that way, I could actually output um, content that I could then use CSS to hide or show. Um, so if debug was in there, that um, the CSS would say, show this whole div set that had the debug information. But I didn't want it out for the public. Turned out preprocess hooks worked really well for this. In this case, I had to figure out which preprocess hook to use. Turns out it was HTML. So let's take a look and see if we can get that one running. If 
If it pops up that JavaScript now. There we go. All right, so you'll see that variables again, same variable set, but because it's a different hook, you get different variables in there, right? What's our code supposed to do? So we were to say, open it up. So what I'm going to do, look at variables down here. You have a variable called user. It's an object, actually. And this tells, am I logged in? Am I anonymous? All this information about them. Now, the thing about Drupal with roles is that an individual account can have multiple roles. So instead of there being a single value there, there's an array. So the code we use is a little bit more complex. What we say here is, if administrator is in this array, using that whole ugh, PHP grossness. Then we're going to add value debug to classes array. So here's the classes array. Does this look familiar? These are all the classes that get added to the body tag. And since it's an array right in there, we can just drop a new one in using this line. Variables, classes. Whenever you see an empty bracket like this when you're setting something, that just says add it, append it to the next uh, open space in the array. Or does it append it to the end? Appends it to the end. So in theory, we should be able to do this. Inspect element. Let's look up here. There's your body. Please work. So in order to figure this out, what I did was I went looking through the various DPM outputs until I found this kind of stuff. Where was this happening at? Dun, 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 dun. Did it do it? Maybe if I had saved the template file, it would have been better. Who spent five minutes going, why isn't this working? Oh, I forgot to hit save. I will sell you to a preschool. Now, if you're really mad, you say, I'll donate you. I, kind of, I used to, I spent two years on a cattle ranch out in California. There you go. There we go. Woo! So I tend to look at computers the same way I look at horses. You know, instead of a glue factory, it's, I will donate you to a preschool. So once you have this at your body level, your CSS controls are pretty easy. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of real world use for this, but it's another example of how you can really, using preprocess hooks, get to any part of your eventual web page. Except when you can't, and then you have to do something different, but it's Drupal, so. This is probably how your DPM stuff gets put on the page. Probably. Either that, or there's some voodoo, there's some like sacrificial chicken or something. I have no idea. So. All right. So we we'll do this. There's the full code. All right, so when I originally put together the presentation, I pitched adding alt text to an image. To give you an idea of the structure we used, we had to have alt text associated with images in the image field, but we were working with a version of media that was still beta version one. Alt text wasn't in there, but we needed it for our specs. We needed to go live. So what I did was, anytime we had an image field, I would add another field to hold the alt text. What this code does, is on preprocess field, with all these nested if statements and all this, it actually takes the image field, takes the alt text, and it pushes the alt text into the image field. So you can see the needle we're looking for is source. 
and we replaced that with alt and then the source. So we were actually to, using preprocess hook, you're able to take those two fields and push them into one into the display in the eventual HTML. If, I, if we were to walk, walk through this, it would be a nightmare. It's here, it'll be in the slide deck, it's here as a reference. You can go pretty crazy with this and get really detailed, but you can do a lot. So that was the point of here. What, what we're doing is we add a field on a node basis, so we actually just add a new field. Don't display it, but it's in there. Since it's all within the same node, we knew that we tagged the field names so that we knew which one matched to which. So we're not actually doing any checks of FIDs or file IDs or node equivalents. There's no database to it. We just simply had them associated at the node level and just pushed them together. So we do the same thing like for contact information. We collect name, phone number, email address, and whatnot. We could then use preprocess hooks. We do this elsewhere somewhere where um, you take those four and you render them into a display where instead of showing the email address, you um, embed it in an AAHREF mail to in front of the name and after it sort of stuff. So you can really do a lot. Some of the stuff you used to do at the template level, the TPL files, you do here. Um, it's cleaner. It's just a lot cleaner and evidently it's supposed to be a lot faster. So, I would love to run a test that proved that wasn't the case, but I don't really want to be haunted by Eric Webb. So. Oh, he's such a nice guy. So. so that was the last example. We have plenty of time. If you guys want to talk more, if you want to see more stuff, if you want to try stuff, admitting that this is painfully slow. Yeah, Ben? With the admin theme, we used the form API. It's similar. Um, we did a lot with that. Um, most, most of the custom module that I built for Iowa now for the admin, almost all of that is working with the forms API. There's some stuff you can do with dropping in validations and whatnot. But it's really the same process. You figure out which hook you want to use. Um, then you go through the data and figure out what you can do. So, Does that help? Aaron Corson was the one who got me started on this. Um, now he calls me and I make fun of him. I'm like, didn't you teach me this? Shut up. Just tell me the answer. So. Anything else you guys want? Any questions? There is a way to do that, and I read an article. If you Google for it enough, I came across it, and I was doing that until I discovered preprocess hooks, and then I rewrote all that code, and that was about two years ago. There's a roundabout way to do that if you use views, build a view that filters on that content type, and then go to the views uh, theme. Like, it'll open up, it'll tell you all the templates involved for everything in that view. One of those will be specific to your content for a setup. I would go this route. If you look here, type is one of the page items. That gives you whatever your content type is right here. So you have that as a decision point before you get to your TPL file if you want to use that. And what you could do as an easy solution would be, um, well, actually what I would do is you already have the content type is bound in the um, body tag in the CSS. So you could just use the CSS, have both header and footers in there and just switch which one you want to display 
without writing any back-end PHP. You could do that with CSS. Mm -hmm. You just do um, set your CSS for whatever the div that holds the header to, and footer, each one, set it to display colon none in your CSS, and that'll drop it out without having to monkey around on the back end. If you're comfortable with CSS, that's the best way to go. It's faster in the processing, and you don't actually have to add any more complexity. So um, my, my rule of thumb is to use CSS whenever possible um, because if you're using Drupal, it gives you so many different classes and crap that's assigned, you can almost always do it. Um, and it gives you one central place. So, does that help? <laughs> Good answer. If, if in terms of the, the information is still there. So, if on a given page, I want to completely suppress the information, so that it, it if you look at the page source, you can see all the CSS and mm -hmm. all the So you want to suppress it, not just visually, but content-wise? Yes. You could then go in and on a per-field basis, there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, but you can wipe out whole sections. Um, are your headers and footers blocks or not? Gotcha. Yes, I actually created a basic page bare content type. Mm -hmm. And on for that particular content type, I wanted no menus, no header, no footer, no sidebars, nothing but the body block. The thing about Drupal is almost always there's six or multiple different ways to do it. What I've found is the way that I figured out that seems to make the most sense to me is the best way until somebody tells me otherwise. Um, and as the only other thing I'd add is if you do it once in a site, keep doing it the same way. Because um, I've had sites that I've inherited where you could see the learning curve as the person got more and more complex. So the same exact change would happen two different places with two completely different techniques. That's mind-boggling. I mean, it's the point where you just you wait until 2 in the morning and you call their house and then hang up. And you do that like four or five nights in a row until you feel better. So. From a payphone. No, 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 no. Calling, calling the firm. <laughs> All right, be calling from a payphone? Call, call, yeah, ah, star 7-9. Yeah, yeah, All right, we're getting into dangerous territory. Are there other questions? Does this seem like enough to get started monkeying around with this? Cool. That was my whole goal was just to, once you see it and you start to go, huh, that's all under there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all very much, and I um, hope you had a good camp. Uh, this was kind of a big deal for us here at the university, so appreciate you guys coming and all that. You work here. Are you? <laughs>